Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Marketing Live for Thursday, June 28th, 2018. I'm Rob Zinkin. I serve as Associate Vice President for Marketing at Indiana University. And today on Marketing Live, we'll discuss discovering your positioning DNA. Marketing Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Our episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education and beyond. Be a part of our live broadcast by sharing your thoughts and your questions. You can participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using the hashtag HigherEdLive. All of our episodes are free and easy to access in the video archives at HigherEdLive.com or take Higher Ed Live with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. If you happen to miss admissions live earlier this week. It was a great episode on redesigning the student experience. So I encourage you to check out that podcast. Higher Ed Live is produced as always by M Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. It's time to get serious about your brand positioning. You need research, critical thinking, creative brilliance, and a digital first strategy. And you need a website that serves as the flagship for your newly articulated brand. How do you get your senior leadership to understand and to buy into the time and resources necessary for a branding initiative and website redesign done correctly? Join M Stoner co-founder and co-owner Voltaire Santos Moran and their branding partner BDK for a free webinar, Pitch Perfect, how to gain internal buy-in. And that's actually coming up this afternoon in less than an hour, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. You can still register if you haven't already. The teams will arm you with the tools, data, stories, presentation approach, and techniques you'll need to build and deliver a persuasive pitch to your decision makers. We'll be tweeting out a link shortly with that registration information. All right, I am so pleased to welcome today's guest, Andy Cunningham. She is co-founder and president of Cunningham Collective, a marketing brand and communication firm dedicated to bringing innovation to market. And it's a challenge, I have to say, to summarize all that she has done over the course of her distinguished career. Her days in Silicon Valley began in the early 80s, helping Steve McIntosh, uh, Steve Jobs launch the original <laughs> Macintosh. <laughs> and she's played a key role in developing branding and launch strategies of numerous game-changing technologies and companies, including Adobe and Apple, just to name a few. And we could run down a list of the world's leading high technology corporations, and you would find Andy and her firm's imprint everywhere in the firms that she has represented. So I can't wait to hear about some of these experiences and also welcome you to our sector for the next half hour or so with a discussion about higher education. So Andy, great to have you. Great to be here, Rob. Thanks for having me. And I know, as I said, we could spend the entire episode, uh, I'm sure, hearing about some of these stories and the incredible journey that you've had. But I will ask if there's something specific from your career that has had a lasting impact or has served to shape that journey or perhaps shape the philosophy of the work that you've done. Sure. So I, I have to say that it, it was certainly the launch of the Macintosh, working really closely with Steve Jobs and the Macintosh team way back in the 80s uh, on, on that amazing product and the amazing person who, who, who built it. Absolutely. I, I learned everything, not everything I know, but I learned a lot of what I know from, from Steve, who was just a very natural marketing genius. Uh, in his head, much more so than a than an engineer. He was not an engineer, as a matter of fact. He was a, a marketing genius. And when you say marketing genius, is that uh, just an innate understanding of what uh, perhaps what the audience needs or doesn't know what it needs, or more would you say about the about the product? Which which side of that, or perhaps both sides? You know, I I would articulate it as Steve had an incredible intuition for product market fit. He understood what a market would want even before they would understand it. And then he understood what kind of product to build in order to meet that unspoken need that was that was out there. But I will say that when he launched the Macintosh, he actually mispositioned it originally. He originally wanted it to be, as he liked to say, the computer for the rest of us, meaning he wanted to replace the IBM PC, which had been launched a couple of years earlier, uh, in all the businesses around the United States. And unfortunately, uh, the people who were using the IBM PCs didn't see any sort of business use for the Macintosh uh, and why they should replace their PC. So what ended up happening is it wasn't selling for the first year or so. It wasn't until he started to see the Macintosh forming a cult around creative people that he realized, oh my gosh, my market is actually not 
the typical business person sitting at a desk in a company. It's the creative person who wants to do things differently, or as he very well articulated later on, think different. It was for the person who wanted to think different. And, and what happened is Macintosh started to be sneaked into the, to the co companies through the back door of the advertising department and the marketing department. And that's how the, the computer actually began to proliferate inside of business. And today I'm on a Macintosh right now uh, in a business. So <laughs> it works. That's great. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing. And uh, we're obviously going to, to get into higher education and, and your perspectives on, on that with the work that, that you've done. And first and foremost, want to make a recommendation to higher ed colleagues about your book, which is excellent. Thank it's you. called Get Get to AHA, Discover Your Positioning DNA and Dominate Your Competition. And one of the things I appreciated right off the bat is the clarity that you provide to exactly what positioning is. And this is a real issue for higher education where that type of work is newer, is less understood than it is in the corporate world. So uh, people often immediately jump to surface level tactics when they hear the word branding. I try to use the word brand strategy to, or the phrase brand strategy to encompass the, encompass the full process. But I, I'd like it if you could break those two terms down, positioning and branding that you do so well in the book. Sure. Thank you. Yes, I see positioning and branding as two different things. They are the yin and the yang of a company's identity. Positioning is the rational side of, of an identity, and branding is the emotional side. And I strongly believe that doing the rational side, understanding the rational side of your position, is, much, is the most important thing to do first before you start to match it up with an emotional tug that you're trying to create with your target market. And what is positioning? Positioning is the articulation of your unique role and relevance in the marketplace. It's the answer to the two most important questions in business, who are you and why do you matter? And I also appreciated how you talk about positioning serving as that bridge between your business strategy and then the face that you ultimately present to the world. And, and that resonated for me in thinking about some of the brand strategy that we, we do with schools and colleges throughout Indiana University. And if we have a school dean and leadership team and we're working through a, a brand strategy process, and I think it is illuminating for them because they realize this is not a marketing discussion. This is a, this is a business discussion. Exactly. All of marketing should be a reflection of business strategy, but positioning is critical on that. You need to understand who your market is and why you fit within that marketplace. And that's, in our, that's your strategy and that's your positioning and that's the answer to the question, who are you and why do you matter? Mm -hmm. And then if you could explain and, and tell us exactly what DNA-based positioning it is, and you, you refer to it as positioning 2.0 and building upon the, the seminal work of Trout and Reese on positioning, but of course that was from uh, another era long yes. before the web. So what do you mean by DNA-based positioning? Sure. So, so in my work, and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of companies, uh, I have really come to the conclusion that there are only three kinds of companies out there really at the, at the core DNA level. There are customer-oriented companies, there are product-oriented companies, and there are concept-oriented companies. And because I was writing a book, I decided to give them nicknames. So I call them mothers if they're customer-oriented. I call them mechanics if they're product-oriented. And I call them missionaries if they are concept oriented. But essentially, there was only those three kinds of companies. And what's interesting about this, because once I came to the conclusion that this is exactly uh, the type of companies that are out there, I realized that they do things very differently. A customer oriented company manages its people differently, hires different kinds of people, trains them differently, compensates them differently, structures themselves differently, and by the way, talks about different things in meetings. Whereas if you look at a, so a couple of customer company examples, Lyft is a great example of that. Nordstrom is another great example of a customer-oriented company. If you contrast that to a product-oriented company, like, say, Oracle or Microsoft or even Walmart, these are companies that structure themselves around their product. They talk about product and they talk about market share in, in their meetings and they hire more product-oriented people. And they're really about building the world's best product and not so much caring about the customer. If you look at the third kind of company, which is a completely different kind of DNA, it's the missionary, as I call it, and these are companies that exist to change human behavior on a fundamental level. 
And some examples of these companies are Federal Express or FedEx. Starbucks is a great example. Tesla is a great example. Apple, of course, is a great example. And these are companies that really end up actually changing the way we behave as, as, as consumers in the world. So, uh, so there are these three different kinds of companies. And this is the add-on piece, I believe, that I've added to the positioning literature, which really only exists of Jack Trout and Mel Reese's book, which was called Positioning, came out in the 70s. And what they really talk about is that positioning is the notion of owning a real estate, a part of a little piece of real estate in the mind of the potential customer. And that is still an important aspect of it. But when you understand what you are as a company, if you're a mother, a missionary, or a, a mechanic, you can make something of that. So I have this little saying I, I say to companies, which is if you know what you're made of, you can make something of it. And it helps you come to that core positioning that is that is true and authentic. And by the way, one of the big differences between positioning back in the 70s when Jack and Al were doing it and positioning today is that uh, authenticity and genuineness is so much more important because of the internet. So you can't just put an ad out and say that you're the very best soda on the market. You actually have to be the very best soda because of the internet and the way that, that, that it's all about dialogue today and not so much just about broadcasting. So I call my book Positioning 2.0 because it takes uh, what those guys did back in the 70s to another level. And Al Reese was, uh, was kind enough, I'm sorry, yeah, Al Reese was kind enough to write me a little blurb on my jacket cover because I think he agrees that it, it really is positioning 2.0. And interesting to hear about those three types of, of companies and, and each with its own distinctive DNA. And how would you view higher education? Where would uh, colleges and universities fit? I, I could see them fitting in potentially in each of those categories, but probably yeah. most into uh, the mother's category as mothers. Well, here's an interesting thing. Every, every, every school is going to be different, just like every company is, is different. And, you know, a, a, an organization like Indiana University has so many different, you know, elements to it, so many departments and colleges and, and everything else that you sort of need to come to an uber positioning for this school. And then each of the individual groups and such can have their own position. I've done a lot of work with UCSF and the same issue exists, exists there. Um, but if you take a company like Amazon is an example, which is a giant company, right? And they do many, many different things. Amazon really started off focusing itself around being an online bookseller, even though Jeff Bezos' business plan included what I like to say is eating the universe one bite at a time. He didn't talk about that until he actually had that, that piece of it. So he started with being an online bookseller, then expanded it to music, and then expanded it to reading, and it, reading Kindle books and, and that sort of thing. And he took it one step at a time. And that's really the secret to great, to great positioning in the market. If you go out and you say we're all things to all people, you'll be nothing to, to no one. So some schools might be mothers. Some schools might be mechanics and some schools might be might be missionaries. In fact, I think some of the early online universities are probably more missionaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And and we, we mentioned how you you've worked over the years with so many game changing technologies and, and companies. And was there there's something along the way that helped to crystallize this approach or DNA based approach to, to positioning and and seeing perhaps how companies who really did understand who they were and why they mattered, seeing those companies thrive? Yeah, I, I have to talk a little bit about a, a client, which is a, 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 a in the construction industry called Building Connected is the name of the company. And uh, it, this is a company that is comprised entirely of men, and they are all guys from the construction industry. So there's a lot of testosterone and macho-ness going on in this company. And when we started to talk with them about how to position them in the marketplace for success, they immediately assumed, of course, we must be mechanics or missionaries, but gosh, we cannot possibly be a mother. Um, but when we had this discussion, we were in the middle of a meeting and they had gotten a call and a, an, a, an administrative person had come into the room and whispered into the ear of the CEO, there's a phone call, uh, you need to come and take it. And he whispered to the other two guys sitting next to him and said, this is, uh, this is urgent, this is a customer, we need, to, we need to take it. So immediately, all three of them jumped up out of the room and ran and took this call. It was a customer who was having an issue with his software. And, uh, and when they came back to the room about 30 minutes later, we said, is there really any question about what kind of a company you are? You are obviously a mother. You care more about your customer than anything else. And all three of you jumped up, the CEO, the CMO, and the CFO all left the room to go deal with this problem. 
in a in a product oriented company that that problem that customer problem would have been funneled to someone in customer success or customer service and that person would have handled it you wouldn't get all three of the senior executives running up and dealing with it so that so it's just a it's a it's just really good to know what you're made of because then you can begin to position yourself that way so now what building connected does is they position themselves as really caring about their customers success with with this it's a it's a software program that helps them deal with contractors and uh, it's like LinkedIn for contractors and they they really treat their customers with immense care and their customers feel that they are differentiated because of that. So in other words, when Building Connected figured out they were a mother, they were able to express their motherness in a way that that caused them to be differentiated in the very uh, macho world of of construction. Well, that's such a such a great example and. Uh, they obviously knew knew who they were, as you said. And and is it a matter? Uh, have you seen where where companies or or organizations perhaps they they take a shortcut to that process and on the positioning side and understanding who they are because they're such an attraction to get to the branding side. That's what's flashy and that's what people get excited about and want to see. And there's always the the excitement around that that piece of it. Yes, it's it's funny. People, most companies would really prefer to start with the branding. In fact, I can't tell you how many new customers I have gotten because they've done the branding first and they don't really have the answer and then they have to go back and start with the positioning. Um, they hire a branding firm who's really good at design and really good at developing taglines. They get their thing. They've spent $100,000 or more on it. They get the, the product and they, they wait a couple of days to begin to execute it. And then suddenly they realize, oh my gosh, that really isn't who we are. Uh, that's never going to fly with this customer set or our board isn't going to appreciate that or whatever the problem is. And then, and then we get called in. It's just always better in life as well as in business to start with the rational and then move to the emotional because then you know what it is you're creating an emotion around. And it's just a, it's just a really important thing to do. So yes, companies make this mistake all the time. And by the way, many companies think that they're missionaries when they're not. They think they're, they think they're because it's so, popular in the technology world to change the world as your mission. Um, a lot of these companies think, well, my mission is to change the world, so therefore I must be a missionary company, and therefore I must exist to change behavior on a fundamental level, when really what they're doing is building something that's better, faster, cheaper than the other thing, but it hasn't really changed behavior. So we have to kind of pull them back from the brink of of suicide <laughs> and, and help them figure out how to talk about their product, if their product or their customer service if they're a customer company, because missionaries are hard to build. Missionary companies are really hard to build. Uh, Elon Musk has done a fabulous job of it with Tesla, but every other car manufacturer is really not the same. They're all, they're mostly all product companies, especially if you look at Mercedes-Benz or BMW, they're really all about the product. They're not about changing our behavior on a fundamental level. So every once in a while, there's a great missionary company that really changes our behavior and they typically make history and they're typically led by cult of personality leaders because that's the kind of person it takes to, to make that, that behavioral change happen in the world. But very few companies are actually missionaries. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back, Andy, to the point you made about the, the important work of positioning because that, that requires time and effort and it doesn't happen overnight. It requires a disciplined process. And I want to put you in the the seat of a higher ed CMO, and if, if you were brought on as a, a college or university's first CMO, or perhaps brought on to advise, how would you begin that type of work? How would you start uh, this type of approach to positioning? Well, what I like to do, especially with a, a large organization like that, is to look at what are the assets that the, that the organization already has. How what are the really great things that that school already has? For example, I think I mentioned this to you before, I sit on the board of a small uh, four-year college, business college in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And we're working on this very same problem with that school. And one of the great assets that this school has is it's located in the middle of Silicon Valley and all of their internships are with Silicon Valley tech companies. So we're working to position, reposition this school uh, as, a, as a Silicon Valley high tech incubator school to, to train people to go work in Silicon Valley companies. So you look at the assets, whatever they are, and then pick out the top three or four that really differentiate that school from other schools. And then you, you focus on, on building language around those three or four assets that really kind of uniquely position that school 
differentiated from the schools around it. So we like to make a competitive map, if you will, of the competitive landscape. And in your case, you'd look at all the different schools that you compete with and draw them on a map and, and figure out how they talk about themselves and look where the white space is. And when you find that white space and you match it up with the assets that you have, those three or four things that I mentioned, then you can begin to create language around that unique role and relevance that Indiana University plays uh, in the marketplace or Harvard or or Northwestern or Purdue or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I also value the points that you made earlier about this work brand strategy is uh, in the book is as much about sacrifice as it is about differentiation to your point that we can't be all things to all people. And and this is particularly critical, but also hard for colleges and universities, especially, right. as you mentioned, in Indiana University, a large public research institution that has a wide ranging mission and so many parts and pieces, schools, departments and various entities. So I'd be interested to take a deeper dive into that and, and get your thoughts into managing some of those complexities when you have a, a multi tiered or multi faceted institution or organization that does so many different things. Absolutely. It's a uh it is very tempting to, when you have so many assets, to try to be all things to all people. But then you just become a, a blob of mush and no one remembers what you stand for. So that's why it's so important to do an inventory of the big assets that you have, you know, and figure out, take a look at those things. And maybe there's 50 of those assets, right? So then you have to start weeding that down to the top three or four things that really stand for the entire university not just one school or another, and then see what, how you can fit those into the competitive landscape in a differentiated sort of way. So it's really a, a process of looking at those big assets and then whittling it down to just a few. And, and what I, I like to say is that um, when somebody is sitting on an airplane talking to, to, uh, to their neighbor and they say, I work for, let's say I work for IBM or I work for um, Apple or whatever it is you work for, and that person says, "Well, tell me, what does that company do?" You've got you. You only have a, a moment to tell them what that company stands for. You don't have 37 minutes to explain all of the you know 50 assets that you that you have uncovered about your company. You say, you know, we're a computer appliance company. I think that's what Steve Jobs would say today about Apple. I don't know if that's what Tim Cook says, but that's what Steve would have said. But you've got to have that top line thing that the, that the organization stands for. And when you have that, then you then you can open up the conversation about the different colleges and the different departments and, and all of the other assets that you have. But if you lose the opportunity to get into that conversation because you've missed, because you basically said, hey, we're a university that's all things to all people, then people just say, yeah, well, then you're nothing to me. I, I don't understand what that means. And that's true for companies, it's true for universities, it's true for hospitals. Um, because every hospital cures people of disease, right? You, you can't say, hey, we cure people of disease. You have to figure out what is it about your hospital uh, or your university that is truly the differentiating factor in the market. And that takes a lot of work. That's what takes a lot of looking at yourself, um, introspection, inventorying those assets, and then comparing that with all of your competitors and what do they say about themselves. And then you're, you develop language that takes into consideration your assets and the white space in the market that puts you sets you aside from the from the competitors, and that's the hard work of positioning. That's own that's coming to own that piece of real estate in the potential customer's mind, or in your case, the student's mind, or the faculty's mind, because you're probably trying to to uh, recruit faculty from other places. Why should they go to Indiana University? You have to have an answer for that. You can't say because we're all things to all people. Definitely, definitely. And one of the challenges also in our sector is the wide range of constituent groups that we serve, a, a lot of different stakeholders. And, and that also comes into play in decentralized organizations across higher ed, where there are a lot of seats around the, the, the leadership table and leadership at different levels. So I also wanted to get your thoughts, Andy, on getting that leadership alignment, because obviously that's critical to grant strategy success. So any advice for that piece of the, the process and in, in alignment from the very top? Sure. Alignment is absolutely critical. I use this example in my book, but when Ken Olson was running Digital Equipment Corp, what he, what he said was, we, um, when you look at our company from the outside, you just see us from the waterline up. And what you see is a, is a formidable uh, battle machine. Uh, that's what he called deck. 
But he said, if you look below the water, what you're really going to see is thousands and thousands of people each paddling their canoe in a different direction. And he used to say, if we could possibly get all of those people under the waterline to paddle their canoes in the same direction, this mighty battle machine that we've created would really have the formidableness that we that we would like it to have. And that is so true um, with within any company, especially big companies. Everybody is going in a bunch of different directions. So the process of coming up with your positioning as a as a university is really one of getting getting the stakeholders to participate in that process. So in my book, um, we have I, I outline what this process is, and I highly recommend that you get players from each of the of the constituents. So you need some donors, you need some board members, you need some faculty, you need some students, you need some administrators. And that group of people together goes through the process and figures out how to position the organization so that each one of those constituents now has their fingerprint on it and agrees with what it should be. And that way you can you can begin to go forward with an aligned version. And it's funny how the process of going through that exercise together actually makes people buy into the result. And uh, it's just human nature that when you work on something you're, and you're a part of it, you like the outcome and then you use it. Absolutely. And I know we can't get into all aspects of the, the book. And again, highly encourage colleagues to, uh, to, to check it out. So many, uh, so many good thoughts in there. Uh, including ones about message architecture and activation and and uh, wondered if you could even just summarize or 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 share a, a couple of high level things to to get people thinking about uh, that part of it as well as we break sure. down positioning and, and branding further. Sure. so once once you kind of understand what you're trying to do when you're developing a positioning statement, it fits into something I call a message architecture, which is the blueprint for every marketing and or communication exercise that your organization is going to go through. And a message architecture contains a number of different things in it, but typically a message architecture will have a vision statement, a mission statement, a value proposition, a positioning statement, a set of key messages, and then an elevator story. And that's sort of what I call the rational side of a message architecture. Then, of course, there's the emotional side, which is what is the emotion you're trying to engender when you when you talk about your your organization. And that is things like, what is your brand archetype? What's your brand essence? What's your brand driver? What's your brand personality? What's your brand attribute? And when you come up with all of those things together, the rational side and the emotional side, in the end, you end up with a, with a tool, a really great tool that we call a message architecture that can be used to inform everything you do, whether it is a a presentation to recruit a faculty member, or whether it's, it's uh, materials that you want to, students to read before they decide on attending the university, or if it's a donor, or whatever it might be, it's a great tool because you want to continue to repeat those exact same messages that live in that message architecture over and over and over again. We all know that that when people really suck in a message, it's because of frequency and consistency of that message. Politicians are so good at this. But businesses and universities are not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think getting better and um, brand strategy has become, uh, I think, a strategic imperative at, at colleges and universities over the last decade or so. So um, an evolving area, but one where I think there has been uh, has been a lot of progress, but also a unique set of challenges, which we've touched Absolutely. on some of those today. A very unique set of challenges. Well, and, lo and looking forward as we as we wrap up, I'm interested in your perspective on on what's next. And is there a uh, positioning 3.0 or <laughs> where will brands be going? And obviously, the, the climate today and, and attaching values to a brand. And, and we see that um, brands are taking positions perhaps more than ever. But but where do you see the direction of of brands continuing to, to try to find that place in the market and, and differentiate themselves? That is, that is a great question. So once you do this exercise and you figure out what your position is and what your brand is, and you've got your messages and you've got your logo and you've got all of that stuff done, the next great challenge for a brand is to make that come to life in the marketplace. And that's, that's, that's the next book, <laughs> but it's also the next thing that a company has to do. And, and I'll tell you the secret to that, the secret to making these new positions come to life in the market, it's through what I call strategic content marketing. We all, we've all heard of content marketing and we all know that it's writing stories about your organization. 
But when you write those stories in such a way that you are subliminally causing the reader to take an action, to go to your website or to buy your product, you are, you are achieving something with that writing that is more than just storytelling. It's actually writing in such a way that it, it encourages an action to be taken. And you do this through what I call memes. And these memes are things that need to be injected throughout your all of the storytelling, all of the content that you're developing that are sticky little phrases that when a person hears them, the entire narrative of your organization comes to mind. The best example I can use for this, uh, there's a couple of business examples. So when Salesforce developed its, its product, um, Mark Benioff used to have the meme, no software. Some people might remember the big red circle with the line through it that said no software. Whenever anybody saw that circle that said no software, the entire narrative of software as a service and cloud computing came into the head of the person looking at it. And that's why that meme was so amazingly successful. Steve Jobs used one with the computer for the rest of us. That was successful. The narrative gets drawn to mind as soon as you hear that meme. Politicians do this well. Donald Trump does this really well. When you hear Make America Great Again, the entire Trump narrative comes before you in your brain. So it's really important as you're doing strategic content marketing that you develop these memes and that you continue to feed all of your content with those memes so that you can create that trigger in a person's mind that they bring up your entire narrative when they just hear that little that little phrase. That's what's well, next. <laughs> great, great. And one of the benefits for, for our work in higher ed is that the, the content is everywhere. Uh, we have so many, so many great things in the in the transformation that higher ed makes in the lives of students and and what they go out and do and the impact that they make and research that faculty do. And there's there's so much, uh, so many stories to tell, but the, the point is an excellent one regarding that all ladders up to, to something, something bigger and, and something differentiating. Absolutely. And if you can get all of your faculty and all of your students and all of your donors and everybody to, to use three or four or five of those little memes that you've created, you really, you'll really see your digital footprint expanding. And in the end, that's really what we're all trying to do. You mentioned a digital first strategy. Absolutely. We are all trying to build the biggest digital footprint that we possibly can for our story. Well, Andy, thanks so much. I really appreciate all your insights today and for lending your mind for a half hour to the, the field of higher education. This has been great. Thank you, Rob. This has really been fun. Good luck to you. <laughs> thanks so much. And a final reminder to, to check out Andy Cunningham's book, Get to AHA. So thanks again to her. Thanks also to Jesse Arthur, who was sharing a lot of Andy's good nuggets throughout the, the course of the half hour on Twitter. And as always, a big thank you to M. Stoner for producing Higher Ed Live and making these episodes possible. I'm Rob Zinkin. Thanks again for tuning in to Higher Ed Live on Marketing Live on the Higher Ed Live Network.